Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I have watched the symposium for years, and I'm delighted I'm here this time. Um, but um, the other thing that struck me as I came from Dublin last night was um, Gaelic, or Gaelic is everywhere. So I felt it only appropriate that I start with words of Scottish Gaelic to do that Celtic connection. So, uh, so that's basically meaning I'm coming with the best wishes of the University of Aberdeen to you here in Galway. And absolutely delighted to be here, um, as I mentioned. So a, a little bit uh, like our previous speaker, um, uh, Declan asked me to talk on novel designs. I said, what will I talk about? And he said, anything. Um, so I'm slightly worried that we've all uh, potentially overlapped our talks, but we've had some little uh, connections. Matt and I have spoken, and uh, I'm going to reel back a little bit of my talk because Matt's going to talk a bit more. But just um, I think across the talks today, we'll get a real insight into what's hot, what's not in trials methodology, and just wanting to um, really have as much of an interaction uh, with you as a trials community as we can. So, okay, um, just another just sort of word of uh, introduction. I'm using the word novel in a few ways. Some are really, truly novel designs, but some of the designs I'm going to mention have been around here for years. But actually, I want us to think about using them in a novel way. Um, so I think uh, sometimes you can think about new innovation as being the only thing we should look at. But actually, it's always important to think back to um, the origins of trial design and actually look back and see what we might use or repurpose. Um, because there are some really neat designs that have been in existence for many, many years way back to the time of Fisher and his agricultural experiments. So that's really where I'm coming from. So you, you may say, oh, why is she talking about that design? We know about it. But I think it's important to think about them and think about using them in different ways. OK, um, so my first, um, I thought I'd set the scene by the current perception I get when I go out talking to clinicians about uh, clinical trials. Um, I was actually doing a debate a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and, and I was doing the debate side, no shock here, I was talking about clinical trials being important, uh, and I was against the debate of um, clinical trials um, were not um, the design of choice. And, and this is the current perception of clinical trials out in the community. Um, the feedback is they're hugely costly, they take far too long, they're marred in regulation, so why the heck are you doing it? Why can't we just move with real world evidence? You've got big data. Um, why do you even bother with a clinical trial? And I think it is important for us all to recognize that this is uh, the, the time that we are, we are working with as trials methodologists. But I, don't, I think we need to take courage. I don't think we should roll over and, 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 and um, leave our design at that point. But I think it is important for us just to start by reviewing the evidence behind um, these claims. Trial cost. Now, I don't need to tell any of you in this audience that um, the cost of a trial is escalating. Um, Eye-wateringly expensive. Um, I'm sure our colleagues from HRB will know this. They'll take one look at a clinical trial and take a sharp intake of breath. It happens around the country and now routinely um, you know, you will put in trial applications for two million pounds, um, three million, that's not unusual. Um, and really, we, we probably as a community have to think about, you know, is this sustainable? Do we, every question we need to ask, is, is it the reality that we need to spend two to three million to get the answer? Um, but these are, I use the phrase often, man-made shackles we've put around a very simple concept of being able to randomize. This is the essence of what we do. This is why we do it. This is the pearl. And actually, we've somehow put this pearl inside a real set of shackles that are very difficult to deal with. So escalating cost, um, recent estimates suggest that we spend about 5.3 billion every year in the UK on clinical trials, randomized trials. And in the US, there's been recent evidence that's uh, highlighted that there's been a fourfold increase over the last two decades uh, in the cost of clinical trials from about um, $4,000 uh, back in 1989 um, to $16,000 per patient in 2011. 
More recent data from the UK, Novartis, suggests that um, currently it's about £8,000 that's spent per patient in trials. Um, and um, even looking at one of the trial funding agencies, publicly funded trials, um, that's increased from about 1,000 per patient in, say, um, uh, 2,000 to about 2,000 patient, 2,000 pounds per patient by 2005. Rampant cost escalation. So, so maybe our maybe our critics are right by saying, you know, wh why are you doing this? But I'll come back to why. Um, I don't think we should lose the peril of randomization in all of this. The second criticism that's always levelled um, is that um, trials take far too long. Um, interventions are in routine practice before the trials are done. Um, and and another um, key thing is, is what's called Buxton's Law. We've heard that a lot of these interventions, people start using them in routine practice and they say, oh, we don't know it well enough yet, we can't evaluate it yet. And then suddenly, oh no, it's in pain practice now. You're too late to evaluate it. And and somehow we've lost we've lost this key moment in time where we can do this trial. And um, it's it, it, it exacerbated by the fact that once you actually do a trial, it takes an awful long time to do them. So um, I was at um, the idea. I don't know if any of you have heard of Ideal. So this is a, a new new um, collaboration promoting evaluation in surgery. And our surgical colleagues um, have not got a stellar track record in, in doing clinical trials evaluation. So the ideal collaboration is all about promoting clinical trials uh, and evaluation as appropriate. But one fascinating statistic that has come out of that is that on average devices, surgical devices for example, have been in the market for at least five years before the results of trials come out. And therefore it's very, very difficult for us as the trials community to come in and uh, potentially take that moral high ground and say, well, you know, it's now, it doesn't work, we've evaluated, remove it, when this is now got into full term implementation. So again, this is something that we need to be thinking about as we're thinking as trialists, what can we do um, to help um, move these forward and, and make it quicker? And then the other one is um, being marred in regulation. Um, you know, we've heard about um, they were trying to do the ethics test of a, of a more efficient design. Absolutely. Um, clinical trials, once, once you move away from just observing practice, which is research, to adding um, a simple randomization, you suddenly step into a parallel universe of regulation. Um, you have very extensive approvals. You've got longer and longer consent forms and longer and longer so-called, I'm putting information in inverted commas, leaflets. We ask, we ask often the participants and, and they don't find necessarily half the information in the so-called information leaflet to be addressing their needs. Often it's a sponsor need, it's a, a, a regulatory requirement. And um, in the UK, we have extensive um, health regulatory authority approvals, research and development approvals, and we have mass excess treatment costs, um, which come in um, when we start clinical trials. All of this leads to time delays. All of it leads to uh, any trialist um, ending up going prematurely grey. And it also leads to um, this, again, Clinicians who want to get involved in clinical trials feel, actually, I don't know if I can face it. I really don't know if I can. And, and in a sense, this has then led um, to, I think, the growth of real-world evidence. Um, we have data everywhere now. Um, and, and ideally, and rightly so, it has some perceived advantages. Um, researchers will tell you you'll get more precise estimates because Obviously, the more data you have, um, the higher and more precise your estimates will be. Data from all patients count. So whenever a patient comes through the healthcare system, you get data collected, and then that data is then used very, very efficiently. You can collect data very quickly. Um, we have many, many patients coming through um, the healthcare system. So very rapidly, you will get a large number of patients. And so one might expect at that point that you should be able to get estimates of effectiveness um, very early on and that they should be very act uh, accurate. 
And um, one of the other really important things about um, real world evidence is that you can get early indications of any rare side effects as they come through. So maybe we should join them and say real world data is better. But this is where I, as a trial methodologist, start to get really angsty, I start to get the fire will fire in my belly. And I will say that all observational studies suffer from selection bias. This is ultimately what we want to do as trialists, is to identify in the most unbiased way, the fairest way, to find out do treatments really, really work. And my worry about um, real world evidence is that um, by default, selection bias is fully integrated within observational data. What you cannot account for is exactly what um, David mentioned. Clinicians choose, they have a patient in front of them, they say, I think this is the right treatment for you. Sometimes it might be the right treatment for you, but if you don't know about treatments B, C, D and E, that may indeed be the right treatment for you, then ultimately you are in incorporating at source selection bias into this real world data. And the impact of this selection bias can be really substantial. Um, there have been many, many um, examples of uh, original observational studies that have then been overturned um, when a randomised trial has been done. Oxygen therapy and myocardial infarction, looking at stenting. There was a recent uh, study for stenting um, in, in cardiac disease. A uh, placebo trial showed that actually it was no better than doing a placebo. Similarly, subacromial decompression for frozen shoulder, taking off the little bony spur, being used forever in, in surgical practice. Surgical trial is done, actually shows it's no better than placebo. So there is a continuing need for trials. And I think it really is the elephant in the room, and it is one of our trump cards that I think we need to be promoting um, as we think about the role of trials in this new world of real world evidence. So um, I'm a highbrow person, not. So the analogy I often use about selection bias, as you can imagine, is, is, is really intellectually stimulating. I think about it like laundry. This is my viewpoint on uh, selection bias. I see selection bias as, as the pink sock of our evaluation laundry. We all know we've had this experience. You have this little rogue red sock sitting in your washing. And you put it all in the washing machine. You just say, yeah, yeah, bang it all in. You get it in and you get this pink mass in your washing machine and you say, it's no worries, I can do color stain remover. Everybody tried that, it ain't ever gonna be white again. You have this sort of slightly blush pink or if you've done the black sock, it'll be that mucky gray. So this is what I think about real world evidence. Observational data which takes a selection bias at source, it says, don't worry about it, it'll be fine shove it all in together, you can do the biggest washing load you can. So you've got observational data here, all messed up. But the problem is, it's all off colour. It is not right. But, you know, we have multiple methods of uh, analysing real world data. We've got matching, we've got fancy propensity matching, we've got all sorts of statistical analytic techniques in play. This is our analogy of the colour stain remover doesn't work. You try and you get a very good estimate but it's still not quite. And so I think we as trialists we need to be very aware this this is the essence of randomization but we cannot walk away from the environment that we are in that uh, real world evidence is seen to be better. And my slight concern is that we, will, we are going on um, starting a parallel universe, that there'll be a little universe of trials that we are all in and very happily in, but out there, there'll be a new real world evidence parallel track. And, and trials will be increasingly seen as rigid, costly and irrelevant. And I think we can do better. And this is where I think novel trial designs really can play a part to help bridge this gap between the so-called real-world evidence and trials. Going back to that debate I was at, 
uh, it was very salient for me. Um, so um, glad to hear that I did swing the debate, um, but I didn't win the war. So I, they took a pre-debate um, pre uh, vote, and the vote was 71 to 18 against Charles, because it was seen to be so straightforward to do in real world evidence. After the debate, it was something like 62-37. So technically, I won the debate because I swung it. But still, the end of the day was everybody thought real world evidence was the way to go. They could fully understand the design and the debate and the, the real purity of the trial because that's too hard. So I think we now need, as a trials community, to think smart because we can compete with real world evidence. So can we be smarter by design? And I think we can. So this today is my war cry to you, our hacker, as we join on our um, trials community. We need to use novel designs to get more out of every trial. We need to use novel designs to make our trials more efficient. And we need to use novel designs to allow trials to be conducted where other people say you can't. And I'm going to show you give you examples of where I think um, we can play a part. So what about novel designs that can maximize gain? This is where we really want to be able to say every single trial you're about to start, I would like you to think, what can I maximize out of this trial? Can I actually ask more than one question in my trial? Do we really need to do simple two arm trial run it for five years, start another simple two-arm trial, run for another five years. This is the question, and how can designs help us do this? One of the most uh, useful designs that has come up in recent literature is around adaptive designs. And um, I'm not going to say very much about it because this is what Matt is going to talk about later. But the principle of it is, is that traditionally, you would have the traditional approach of doing separate um, phase two trials running into separate phase three trials. What happens now when you can do a multi-arm or multi-stage trial, you start with all the possible interventions at the start. You can then enrich or remove as you go through um, once you actually understand and get early evidence that you some interventions you can fail early some interventions look of high benefit. So there have been a number of um, recent publications around this. I'm sure um, Matt will probably talk about the Stampede trial. Um, this has um, uh, just been um, published last year. It won trial of the year at the Society of Clinical Trials um, last year. So it's absolutely where we're at in novel designs at the moment. What we want to be able to say is, Lots of interventions get them straight into the evaluation framework, knock them out early if they don't um, show early effectiveness. I'm not going to say any more about that. But I will then say, OK, let's go back into our toolkit. What do we currently have in our toolkit that we can use? And I think we can use factorial designs much, much more efficiently than we ever have done. These have been around for years, but actually we don't use them that often. Factorial designs evaluate multiple interventions, so you, you can evaluate possible combinations. There are also, um, so, so you've got two treatments, you've got treatment A and treatment B, so you can do none, A alone, B alone, B, A and B together. You can also do partial factorial, so you don't need to do the full suite of it, but say wherever I can have a multiple comparison that I, they can share randomization, I can do that. And then we can push the boundaries. I don't think I've seen any examples yet, but fractional factorials. So the, the idea behind a fractional factorial is when you've got a very, very large set of interventions and you don't know which combinations you should probably test, you can use statistical methodology to identify the ones, the, the treatment combinations that will give you the maximal statistical information from that trial. So I think we need to be using that more um, to um, design our trials. And I'll give you an example. So we recent, well, we didn't recently, um, one of the trials that we've run out of our unit is called the knee arthroplasty trial. And our aim was 
um, it, it's all about knee replacements um, and um, a very routine operation. And our aim was, how could we address as many of the important questions in knee replacement uh, um, uh, research as quickly as possible? We didn't want to be doing one single trial, then another single trial. So we, we got all the clinicians together and said, what are the burning questions in your field? And they came up with four core questions that they felt they really need answered. So we said, OK, we'll do them all together. So we um, took the CAT trial and, and designed it to answer all four research questions in one trial. We undertook a partial factorial design wherever we could we um, wanted to um, recruit simultaneously to more than one intervention. So um, I'll just give you a bit more background. So what was that? Here's a nice picture of a knee replacement. They said, we don't know if we, when we're putting in a knee replacement, should we resurface the back of the kneecap? We don't know, good or bad, we don't know. Our little uh, metal, uh, our, our knee replacement components, we don't know if we should put a metal backing on them or a plastic backing on them. We don't know what's going to wear out most. They also said, we don't know if we should put a mobile bearing in so that the knee can twist better afterwards, or if that just adds noise to the system. And then finally, they said, we don't know if we should replace just the diseased joint or we replace the whole knee. And traditionally, we'd have done those four trials totally separately, would have taken time. So we sat with them and said, well, actually, can you, can you multiply do this? And they said, yeah, of course. So, you know, we can also do, we can randomize people to having a metal backing and the kneecap being replaced. We can, we can mix and match some of these things. So we said, okay, we'll do that. So we had uh, 34 centers took part in this study. And um, you'll see from the graph here that, you know, still the majority took part in one comparison, but 16% took part in two of the comparisons, and 5% um, were enrolled into three of the comparisons all at once. So it was much, much greater efficiency. 15% of uh, our target uh, pa patients contributed to more than one comparison. So for one, one participation, we got answers to up to three uh, trial questions. The target sample size was achieved much more quickly, and it to date remains the largest trial ever undertaken in new replacement surgery because we thought big and we thought smart. So here it is. We randomized uh, just short of um, 2,400 patients. Um, each, in comparison, had its own uh, sample size calculation along it, but um, we identified that um, where we could, patients would maximally uh, incorporate their data. So between metal backing and their kneecap being replaced, we had an extra 147 procedures donated by uh, patients into both. And also mobile bearing with the kneecap replacement, and we had an extra 200 randomizations just for free because we had done this multiple comparisons. So I think, um, what I think we need to be thinking much more clearly is when we start out on a trial, we don't just think about the question that's uppermost in our mind. Talk with the clinicians, talk with the health professionals, say, actually, are there other things we should be answering at the same time? And it, it's really interesting. I'm involved in a trial with uh, Declan and Elaine just now. I was just delighted to see factorial design was right front and center of that design. So already, much more efficient design from the start. So point number one in our war cry, novel trial designs uh, do more. Secondly, we need to do, use our novel trial designs and our eye trials to be more efficient. We need to be much more aerodynamic in our trials. And any of you who go back to the 80s where all the cars had go faster stripes, this is what we need. We need trials with go faster stripes on them. And I think we can do that. There are certain ways and means that we can be smarter with our designs to get exactly that. And again, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And this is a, a new and emerging field. And this is the field of registry-based um, randomized control trials. And um, the idea behind this, so registries, there are many, many clinical registries out there. I'll show you some examples later. 
So this is um, purely registries of diseases or devices, um, and they're already there and built and being used by the clinical community. And the idea behind a registry-based randomized trial is you use the registry as a platform for data collection, follow-up, and ideally nesting the randomization right in it. If you've got a chronic disease registry, there is no reason why you can't drop randomization into that registry. So this little um, cartoon shows you just that. You've got a patient, you randomize, all the infrastructure's there, the data's collected routinely in the background um, to the computer, and then you get the answer. Lots and lots of registries out there. I um, led some research last year to look at trying to map the registries that were available, and certainly in the UK, there's a, around 200 clinical registries currently um, available in the UK, and many of them are big, hugely um, important. The National Joint Registries there that um, logs details of every joint replacement you have. There's the Scottish Renal Registry. There's similarly the UK Renal Registry. Everybody who's um, requiring dialysis or renal replacement therapy. There's the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest um, database. There are heaps of them. So I would suggest that probably in every clinical field there'll be some form of clinical registry out there that we should be thinking much more clearly, can we use this infrastructure to facilitate our trials? This um, phenomenon of um, randomized registry trials or registry trials is, is, is really getting a lot of traction um, recently. It has been gone so far as to be called the next disruptive technology in clinical research. This could revolutionize how quickly, how efficiently we can do trials. And the tr trial I've showed here is called the TEST trial. Um, it was run uh, by a group in Scandinavia um, using their Scandinavian registries. And the Scandinavians are superb at re recording registries. And they managed to do this at $50 a patient to do the randomized trial. Think back to the figures I gave you earlier. £2,000 a patient, £8,000 a patient. This was done $50 a patient, and they uh, recruited way ahead of time, way, way quickly, because they had the infrastructure there already. This is exciting. So how can we do this? Well, I'm going to give you an example of one of the trials that I currently lead at the moment in the UK. It's called the UK Reboa trial. I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about the actual um, ins and outs of it a bit later on. But this, this is, happens in um, major trauma centers, people who have really um, devastating injuries and they're bleeding out. And the idea is that you um, put a small balloon, you roll it up through the femoral artery, you blow up the balloon and you can stop the bleeding. That's the idea behind it. But actually, um, what we have in the UK is that this... Um, TARN database. This is the Trauma Audit Research Network database. Every major trauma patient gets all their data logged on the Trauma uh, Network database. So what happens in the UK Reboa trial is the patient comes in into um, A&E. Um, they get identified. They on um, the clinician's phone. They have a mobile app. They press randomize. Ten seconds later, they have whether they need to do this Reboa technique, this balloon technique, or standard technique. That's it. Pretty much that's it. Everything else is collected directly through the TARN database. We collect two pieces of information. That is it. We collect on the second page, we collect what time the, the balloon went up and what time the balloon came down. That's it. We collect nothing else in the trial. <coughs> Everything else is done through the routine infrastructure. And we then get the data downloaded to us from um, the TARN database to give us um, our outcomes, our mortality, all the rest of it. This is the future. This is what we need to be thinking about. We don't need huge clinical research forms. We need to be thinking smart around this. Not every registry, though, is just sitting there perfect to be used for uh, randomized trials. 
But one really great resource, in fact, just a great resource for all things trials in the US is what's called the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. Um, and they have got a neat set of resources around many things, and one of them is around um, registry-based trials. And they've developed this really nice uh, flow diagram that you can use as a quality assessment for your registry to see if it is um, fit for purpose to be run um, for a randomized trial. And so you can see it's quite complicated here, but it's three main elements that they look at. They look at relevance of the registry, they look at robustness of the registry, and they look at reliability. These are the criteria that uh, require to be assessed. So just in a bit more detail, these are the things that they ask you to go and look for or that we should look for in the registry. It clearly needs to be relevant. So it needs to be uh, adequate in scope and purpose to the question that you're looking at. It needs to be already used in the clinical field. It needs to have outcomes that are uh, appropriate, uh, collected that are relevant for the trial. And it needs to have the appropriate geographical uh, coverage. Robustness, it needs to have high participation rates. There's no point in using some, some of these sort of uh, volunteer, uh, you know, participation in the registry is voluntary because you only get, you know, a select group of patients. You want data collected using standardized protocols. So this is all about the quality of the data. And then they also want you to look at reliability. So has this data already been used to inform high quality publications? Is it open to regulatory inspection? Um, what can you get timely access? Because it's a bit pointless if you want to do your trial and you have to wait three years to get the data out of it. So these are the main criteria, but I think this is an area we could be much more um, smart with um, as clinical trial is moving forward. So another example that I think, another old style design that we don't use half as much as we should. And this is the, cr the, the uh, crossover design. They're very, very efficient and they use patients or sites as their own controls. Now again, you can't use them everywhere, but I don't think we routinely think, can we use a crossover design uh, in our studies? So again, I'm going to talk about the Sudoku trial, which is a trial that I've been involved in. So this is in critical care. And um, people in critical care are very susceptible to infection. And um, so it's been uh, promoted that there's a bit of an antibiotic paste that gets rubbed on, uh, on the, um, the mouth and in the mouth and down into the digestive tract. And um, can this help with uh, mortality and infection? The worry is that you'll then overuse um, these uh, sort of antibiotic treatments and you'll actually create more problems in the surrounding community. So it needs to be a cluster trial because, you know, whatever you do on the ward, you need to, or the critical care unit, it needs to be um, all the patients treated together. So we um, scratched our heads around this for a long time. So we thought, okay, we should probably just do a standard cluster trial. That's the norm. And we thought about it and we said, okay, we'll go and do, look for a 3% difference in mortality. And the design required probably about 23,000 patients. That's a bit of a tough ask. We only have about 52, you know, we, we were wanting to include about 50 to 52 ICUs. I was like, oh, gee, you know, how long are we going to have to go to get 23,000 patients? And then we actually thought much more clearly about it and thought, actually, can we do a cluster crossover? Can the ICU do the intervention for a period, then cross over, and then similarly the other way around? And we thought about this. We did due diligence around it. And, and this is the design we've run with. We're now running with a cluster uh, crossover design, and the sample size calculation has been halved. We expect, depending on the final cluster, so any of the, you who do cluster trials, you'll know the sample sizes alternate with cluster sizes. So we will require between 10 to 15,000 instead of 23,000 patients. Huge difference, much fewer patients exposed, much quicker answer, much, much easier to organize. So again, use the, desire, uh, the designs in a novel way. So the final thing I mentioned was to use novel trial designs to allow trials to be conducted where people say you can't. And I think we should sort of get our inner Nelson Mandela working at this point. 
But if he can do it, we can do it. He said it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's what we should be thinking as trialists as we go forward. So the thing I didn't mention um, in the CAT trial was we did actually have, I said how great it was, if you were looking closely, there was one little intervention on the side that didn't do so well. This one about putting um, the, just the component of the knee versus the total knee. There was a major issue with equipoise. One of the surgeons would say, I'm only replacing the component, the other one, and say, I would never do the total one. And then the total people would say, ah, oh, you need to take the whole knee out. There's... So we actually only recruited 34 patients. Shh, I didn't mention that. So our options after the CAT trial was, okay, do we give up at this point? And it's going to be used in practice. We're not going to know what the answer is. Or do we think differently? And we decided to think differently. And so we adopted a novel design called the expertise-based trial design. So many of you may have heard about this, but if you haven't, this is how it works. So here, surgeons form a pair and one each, an expert in each intervention. So in each site, you've got a, a uni compartmental surgeon and you've got a total surgeon and they agree to work as a pair. You still randomize, so the patient is randomized and then they're diverted off to the appropriate expert in the pair. And so your standard trial design would be patient comes in, patient gets randomized, surgeon has to do either of the procedures and that's what they were uncomfortable with. Here, the expertise-based design, you then, you do need the pair, so the logistics is more complicated, but um, then you randomize off um, to, to the different experts. So what happened under this model? Well, this is the top cat trial, which is another trial that um, I'm uh, involved in methodological lead for. So this is total or par partial, neoarthroplasty trial, son of cat. And we embedded here, we randomized 531 randomized. It is one of the few trials. The recruitment graph is ahead of target. When do you see that? Look at this graph, ahead of target. We recruited faster and we've recruited more. From the jaws of defeat, we snatched probably a little bit of victory. So we're just finishing, um, one year data has been completed. This month, we're finishing five year data completion on the trial people said we couldn't do. This is the type of innovation and thought we need to adopt as trialists. Then the final thing I'm going to talk about is dealing with small numbers and rare diseases. Let's go back to Reboa. Reboa is a registry-based trial. It also, Reboa has many issues. Reboa, its other major issue is that really these patients are as rare as hen's teeth. It's very, very rare that somebody, somebody comes in with such level of catastrophic injury that you would be looking for Reboa. There's only about 60 of them in the entirety of the country every year in the UK. And it would have taken 20 years to do the full-on trial. So again, um, the other thing to notice is it's hugely heroic. Um, it's in all the papers, you know, the helicopters fly in, they rescue these patients, they take them to A&E, they give them a balloon and it's just... It's been all over the news. So the clinical community want to go straight to implementation. So we as trialers need to make a decision. Again, do we give up and say, okay, um, we're never gonna be able to run your traditional trial, uh, or do we think differently? And again, we didn't give up. We said, we are gonna use a novel design solution for this. And we adopted Bayesian trial design for this, and again, novel it's getting a lot more traction but this potentially is the way forward for us bayesian trials are fundamentally different from the classical trial design in a i'm just got one minute to go um the probability is it's all about probability so you don't have p-values in a bayesian trial you get a probability so you say it's 80 percent probable this is successful and it's totally different and and some trialers just find it really difficult to get your heads around it because it's a, a decision-making framework. And anybody who's done health technology assessments with places like NICE and SIGN, this is their world. And so actually, as a decision-maker, the world of Bayesian trials makes total sense. It's what you do is saying, given a set data sample size, what can I say about it? 
So here you say start with a feasible sample size. We would get 120 patients in two years and say, what can I possibly say with 120 patients? You then can um, set characteristics, operating characteristics, saying I could likely say it's going to be this much successful, this much for harm, and so on. So again, we need to be thinking out of the box. And it's transformed an infeasible study into a potentially feasible study. This is live, Rebo's ongoing. We've recruited 19, actually we've recruited 20. We got another one yesterday. So it means that we can do a trial in a field we could never have thought about doing it before. It requires meticulous planning, but the peril of randomization is still there. So what is the role of novel designs in our trialist toolkit? I want us all to put on our superhero cloaks and say, best used to maximize the yield of a trial, maximize the efficiency, and expand the scope into difficult evaluation spaces. I'll leave it there.